So this is a talk about Minui, which is probably one of the oldest and the most used program in the, in the world of physics. Uh, and I suppose many of you know it, and many of you probably don't know it very well because you use it uh, not at all or through uh, another interface. Because what Minri does is it analyzes a function, which is usually of one of these two forms, either a chi-squared or a likelihood, log likelihood function. This is a term that physicists use for these uh, functions. And that's the function that Minri is going to minimize. Uh, uh, and uh, it's going to do what uh, physicists call the error analysis. So I'll talk about that. Now, it's, it's an old program because it was written uh, when, uh, well, it was written in the days when there were no programs of this kind, even though when, when we had the earliest computers. Uh, and I was at, uh, at Yale when they got the very first computer. And so there was no software. And of course, no, no Minui. Minui came a few years later, five or six years later. <clears throat> and, but so, uh, so it, it, had to be, it had to be written. There was a program existing at that time, uh, written somewhere in the Soviet Union. It went through, uh, uh, it went through Berkeley and it arrived, it, to, to me, uh, it was called MinFun, and it was supposed to minimize and do error analysis. It didn't work very well. And so I decided there had to be a new program that would uh, do what I wanted to do. And that's, what, that's how Minui began. It was a long time ago. Uh, it was after I did my thesis. I did my thesis actually at BNL uh, when the AGS was the most powerful uh, accelerator, proton accelerator in the world. That was in the 1960s. And since then, physics has changed a lot, of course. We get much bigger data samples. But the, the statistics is basically the same. We have learned something, but not an awful lot. So I'm going to tell you about what we've learned and what, what Minri does for you. OK, so. Uh, when we, when we wrote Minui, the chi-square was the thing that was most often used. Uh, likelihood was beginning to be used. But uh, so Minui does both. The problem is that chi-square, of course, has to be minimized when likelihood has to be maximized. So Minui only does one of those, and we did it. We decided to, to do the minimum. So chi square, so Minui looks for a minimum of your function. And so if you do, if you have a log likelihood, then uh, can you see my cursor when I move it here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Good. Okay, fine. So when you, you have a chi square, it's designed for chi square, so it does a minimum. If you have a likelihood, you gotta put a minus sign in front of it. You mustn't forget the logarithm because the, the logarithm of the likelihood is what has the form of, uh, has properties that resemble the chi-squared. And then there's a factor of two, which it comes in, which is uh, because the, the derivative of x squared is 2x, essentially. Now, <clears throat> so here, in here we have the, the three parameters of theta. So you have to have your model, which describes, which hopefully describes your data. And theta is the parameters of this model. And it, it is uh, in this way for a chi-squared and this way for a likelihood. And <clears throat> uh, x is now your data. Uh, events are at positions xi for the likelihood. And x uh, in the chi-squared, it's xi uh, has a value yi. Now, I mean, we can, uh, in principle, minimize other functions. But it doesn't work very well if they're not parabolic at the minimum, OK? So it assumes that they're parabolic. And that, in, in, for these kind of statistical functions, they always are parabolic. The threat is the closer you get to the minimum, the more parabolic it becomes. The, 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 and uh, at the very minimum, of course, 
the derivatives are zero, and that's what Minu, that's what Minu, uh, that's the point that Minui wants to find. But it doesn't use the derivative of the function as a signal of when it has arrived at the minimum. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, uh, oh, this no, that's not the right arrow. What is the right arrow? I forget. I'll try scrolling, I okay, guess. Scrolling works. Now, if the model is a linear function of the parameters, the problem is linear. So go back. So in, here we have the model f of theta as a function of data uh, x. And uh, if f of theta is, a, is linear in the parameters theta, then this is a linear problem, except that sometimes sigma squared also depends on theta. And in fact, that you, because usually you have the, you, you don't want to compare with the, with the actual events observed, but with the events you expect to observe, which is f, which means that sigma squared would be uh, would be f and, uh, and rather than y, and so it depends on theta. So if this depends on theta, then the problem is already nonlinear, because even if this is a linear function of the of the parameters, so nonlinear, so linear problems uh, are in fact relatively rare. But if you have a linear problem, you don't actually need linear. It's just a matrix inversion gives you the exact solution and the full error analysis. So, uh, so what if you have a linear problem or you don't know if you have a linear problem? You can use Minui anyway, because if it is linear, Minui will find it, uh, the answer immediately and do the, uh, the same error analysis that you would do if you knew you had a linear problem. But we usually have nonlinear problems, and that's what Minui is good at. So, uh, Minui will have, uh, well, one of the things that was new with Minui was that you had a, a possibility of issuing commands to Minui. It didn't, it didn't, wasn't a program that just did what it did. You, you had to tell it what to do. You could tell it you wanted to minimize, you wanted error analysis, what kind of error analysis you wanted. And then that allows you then to do all sorts of other things, which we'll, uh, we'll uh, talk about here. So. You, you start out by specifying the starting values and step sizes for all the variable parameters. And, uh, and you can also put in constant parameters if you wish. And that, that makes it more convenient to use because then you have all your parameters that are there in your list. And the, the number of the parameter, the, the number that you give it to is, the, is what is referenced inside your FCN function. So you, and it's convenient to have it a certain parameters always the same number so that you can uh, use the same uh, FCN for different problems and the, uh, the, the and you give it a parameter a name uh, and then you know what what that means menu doesn't of course use the name but it tells you what the name is uh, you have to provide a, this procedure FCN that calculates your function, your likelihood as a, as a function of the variable parameters. And you can also constrain, uh, Linry can constrain some parameters to lie inside certain bounds. Uh, you give it the bounds, you have to give it two bounds, upper and lower limits. But you uh, usually, uh, it's uh, preferable if you don't give it bounds. Uh, Minui, it doesn't help Minui unless it's going to prevent Minui from running away to infinity, which it can easily do if you make a, a mistake or if you have, your data isn't, isn't very good. So you will learn from experience whether you need to put bounds on the parameters. Uh, and uh, uh, it's usually at least uh, in the last step it's good to remove the bounds and let Minui do it without bounds. Then you can find, for example, if it's going to go outside the physical region, you'll see whether Minui wants to put it outside the physical region or not. And then you issue commands, and the usual usually you start by issuing a, a migrad command, which does the minimization. And uh, but you may start, you may want to first find the region of the minimum with some other commands, for example, fixing a parameter, 
you want to find the region where this parameter has this value, you say you can fix that parameter, then do a minimum minimization with respect to all the others, and then restore that one, and then do a final minimization, and you'll find the minimum which has that value or close to that value of the parameter. And uh, then you can do a full error analysis, which is actually uh, very easy, very simple. Enough. Now, what can go wrong? Before we say what's good about the league of there are few things that are good about it. What can go wrong if the FCN uh, includes a calculation which has, introduces a random error? Uh, for example, that can happen if you do a Monte Carlo integration of, uh, of your function in a, in a likelihood. Uh, function, you, in a likelihood function, you have to minimize, you have to uh, normalize the function so that the integral over all the data space is constant in, in respect to theta. And if you do that by Monte Carlo integration, then you're going to introduce an additional uh, error, random error. And then uh, Minri, of course, has had trouble. Because it's going it can't, it maybe likes to calculate derivatives with respect to the parameter. And so if it calculates two values which include a Monte Carlo calculation, it's going to get uh, uh, confused. So uh, what Minri does, in fact, the very first thing it does is it first calls the function twice with the same parameter values, and it should get the same uh, function values. And if it doesn't, it complains and it stops. Uh, so now, if the number of free parameters is too big for the amount of data that you have, that then the system is underdetermined, of course, and FCN cannot find a minimum, it doesn't have a well-defined minimum. That's a famous uh, case that can happen. And you sometimes you don't notice it, you don't realize that you're adding more parameters and the, the data is changing and, and suddenly it doesn't work. And you might not realize it. it's because of this, your problem becomes underdetermined. Meaning we can spot that because it can detect it that the error matrix is non-positive definite. So it, and then it tells you about it, of course. Uh, if a bounded parameter gets close to one of its limits, then you run into a special case, which is that your, the, <clears throat> that your, your limit becomes active, as they say, your constraint becomes active and when the state is active, what you actually, are doing is you're re reducing the number of parameters in the problem and the rank of the error matrix goes down by one. So the whole problem changes. And at that point, uh, you should realize that and remove that parameter from, the, put it at its limit, remove it from the uh, list of uh, variable parameters. Uh, the whole treatment of constraints is a very special thing. Uh, there are programs that are designed specially to handle that. Minri is not designed specially to handle that, but it will it will uh, work well for this kind of what we call rectangular limits. And the parameters are badly scaled. If you have parameters with enormous uh, values, uh, then obviously this, the floating point, uh, even double precision, may not be good enough to do uh, to do. Uh, uh, derivatives. So these are various things that can go wrong. Um, there are probably more, uh, but usually it works. And when it works, uh, this is what it does. First of all, it assumes that the starting parameters are going to be in the region of attraction of the minimum that you want. Uh, the problems can have lots of minima. Uh, some of them you, you know, since some problems, you know it's going to have lots of minimum and you take, take that into account. Uh, sometimes you don't realize it. There's a, a very nice uh, uh, figure in this uh, by, uh, in a book called Data Analysis of High Energy Physics. Uh, and uh, uh, Lorenzo Manetta, who's the guy taking care of Minri at the moment at CERN, the root team, uh, he has a nice figure here, which shows if you if you scan a histogram, which has a lot of little fluctuations, and you look look at the likelihood function, scanning it for the position of the, the 
peak you're looking for, you find that it has lots of peaks in the likelihood function or minima and chi squared function. And uh, so you have to, if you really want to find a particular, study one particular peak, you have to start it there and you have to guide it so that it finds the one you want. Uh, but so Migrad is not uh, uh, guaranteed to find the best minimum. It will just find the, the nearest one that it, that it happens to fall into if there are lots. So that's another problem you have to be worried about. But once it gets near, near the minimum, it uses uh, this variable metric method of Fletcher Powell and Davidon, which was when, uh, when I wrote this, this was uh, uh, these people and, and others, mostly in, uh, in Britain, in, in England, were working, uh, de developing new methods for minimization. This was in rather the early days of computing. And suddenly this idea of minimizing functions and, as well as uh, integrating them and other things became suddenly very important numerical methods. And they made some beautiful methods, which I uh, uh, read as they came, as they were published, and put them into the Minri. And the one that, the, the one that uh, is actually used now is called a variable metric method, where the, the metric is in is uh, is the vector is the matrix which determines the the distance between two points basically okay that's the, in general the definition and I happen to have studied the general relativity at that time and I was very interested in this because the the, this, the metric in general relativity of course is the is the metric tensor. Uh, and the metric, if you know the metric tensor, that is what enables you to find the distance between two points uh, in, in, a, in a very general way, the general relativity. Theory. And so what it does is it, it's, it, it moves toward the minimum, uh, always predicting where the minimum is going to be, and then jumps to where it thinks it's going to be. And of course, it's not there because it's, it's nonlinear. If the problem is linear, it jumps immediately to the right. Minimum. But if it's nonlinear, it has to make some, uh, some steps to get there. Uh, but if you uh, know a little bit about uh, metrics, and in particular from general relativity, you know that there are some things which are invariant. And so when I was writing this, I said, look, there's got to be some invariance here. What are some things that we must know, even though we don't know the full metric in, 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 a, in any particular uh, coordinate system? And the, the, the one invariant which I found was one which I called uh, EDM, which is a, which is the, Okay, they always, there is always of the form G, V, G, where G and the G's, uh, G transpose and G are two vectors, and the V is a matrix. And, and if, if, that, if that form uh, follows the, the rules of general relativity, then, uh, and then that is a scalar. So that's an invariant. And then the variant I found is called EDM. Which is uh, which uh, I call that for because it means the expected distance to the minimum, and wherever the, it is, wherever the 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 point is that you have arrived at at a given time, uh, if you know the second derivative matrix and the gradient, you can calculate this uh, quantity, which is in fact the the distance in function value between where you are. And where and where the minimum is going to be, and that is should be an invariant. So uh, that's used in as a in Minri as a, a criterion for when you have converged. They've converged when the when the EDM 
uh, goes to zero. And then that's properly scaled so that it, you don't, you're not going to go uh, to infinity unless the minimum is not at a point, but along a line, which happens if you've got an underdetermined uh, system. And the EDM turns out to be incredibly accurate, as I discovered when I was, uh, I was given the job on an experiment to, to do the track fitting. And so I did the track fitting and of course I used, I didn't use Minui exactly, but I used the code from Minui to, because this was, had to be done on, on millions of tracks. So you don't want to put in a heavy program which is going to calculate things you don't need. And, and when I calculated, and I you had to calculate the starting values, of course, so uh, this, I had the, the hits in the different tracks and I calculated uh, starting values and then I ran Minri. And what happened was, that as, as I always do, I got the sign of the magnetic field wrong when I calculated the starting values. So the starting values were for a, for a track which is curving to the left and it was actually curving to the right. So the starting values were way, way away from the final fit values, but the EDM was still correct. So instead of, I knew that the, the chi square should be small when it, at, the, at the fit, but for the starting values, the chi squared would be, I don't know, 21,000. But then the EDM would also be 21,000 because it knew that, it, that the final chi square was going to be very small, close to zero. And it was incredibly accurate. So that works very well. That, that method works very well as long as it's not too far from a parameter. So it knows where to stop. And looking at all the other program, the other algorithms that people like Fletcher Powell David on were working on, and they all had test programs and they showed you how well they worked and everything. But they, what they all, all did uh, one thing very badly, which is that when they got to the minimum, they didn't realize they were at the minimum. They didn't know. It's not so obvious because you can't, of course, the derivatives have to be zero at the minimum, but they're also zero at a, at a saddle point, for example. So the derivatives going to zero uh, is not a good criterion for, for finding when you're at the minimum. And the EDM is, is extremely good criterion. And if you know when to stop, you save half the time compared with the programs that don't know when to stop because they keep going until they give up. And because they don't have a good uh, criterion to stop it. So that was the one big advantage in uh, Migrat over other programs that tried to do that. They didn't know about, uh, about this uh, invariant distance from where you are to where you, you want to be. And uh, now when, the, when you're at the Migrat minimum, uh, or which is the maximum for the likelihood, of course, and the minimum for chi-squared, and this is a problem which is going to, uh, it, fortunately, it's a small problem we can get around easily, but it's, it's going to be with us because uh, the theory of statistics is always done in terms of, of the, of the uh, likelihood. It's always, you always talk about maximum likelihood. Uh, the chi-squared is, a, in a sense, a special case of likelihood for, for parameter where parameter errors are uh, oops, where well, parameter errors are a Gaussian. Uh, so the so the the method of uh, the best method of uh, estimation is called maximum likelihood. It's not called minimum chi square. So in the, in the books on theory, you always going to see maximum likelihood. And what we know now is that the maximum of the likelihood under very general conditions. Uh, always occurs at the point in the parameter space, which is the closest to the true value of the parameter being estimated, which is uh, uh, that has been in, in a way that has been known for a long time, but not exactly in this way. What has been known for a long time is that there's a, the, uh, there's a variance, the minimum variance of, a, of an estimator 
uh, is known and the minimum if you obtain the minimum variance then you have you're the closest in some sense to the to the uh, to the true value of the parameter but uh, it in uh, expressed in this way that of all the points in the parameter space the one which is closest on average, okay, the, uh, to the true value is the, is the maximum likelihood estimate. So you can't do any better than that. Uh, and that's true, even though you don't know what the true value is. This is, <laughs> this is the thing that is amazing. And so, uh, but when you have studied statistics a lot, you get used to that. It's, it's true. Now, in addition, it's invariant under transformation of coordinates. So the maximum likelihood, the maximum of the likelihood is invariant. It's consistent. That means that as you get more data, it converges to the true value. And it's asymptotically Gaussian distributed. And this has been known for a long time. But uh, uh, in the in the books, even the the best books, the most uh, uh, the most uh, advanced books of statistics, they say that it's under very general conditions. It's true, but they don't tell you what the conditions are. And so I wondered whether they actually knew what the conditions were, because they never tell you what they are. And if they knew, that they would tell you. So I was very worried about that. And I finally discovered what the conditions were. And that this is the, the main condition that has to be true, uh, that the allowed range of data, okay, the integral over the over x, uh, the allowed range of that integral, uh, if that depends on the value of the parameter being estimated, then this is not necessarily true. The maximum likelihood won't be there. So now, can this happen in physics? Sure, it can happen. It's not very often happens, but if you, start, for example, are uh, looking at uh, decay of a, of a particular particle of a given mass, and the mass is unknown, and measuring the mass, and you and the the range of possible momenta and angles of the tracks that come out depend on the mass of the particle, and that's precisely the problem. So the range of possible data, which are the angles and momenta of the particles coming out of the, uh, of the decay products, uh, are going to depend on the mass that you're looking for. If that's true, then the maximum likelihood not necessarily uh, uh, the closest to the true value. And the other possibility is if the maximum lies in unphysical region. And that makes lots of problems. And for that reason, I, that's one of the reasons that I prefer not to put bounds on the parameter, even though you know the mass should be uh, positive. Uh, if you don't put uh, bounds on the parameter, and if the likelihood is at least defined uh, in the non-physical region, sometimes it's not defined in the non-physical region, but if it is at least defined that way, then you want to know whether the maximum lies in the physical region or not. And so it's better not to put a, a bound on it. Of course, it's it's embarrassing for the physicist who find who measures a mass that comes out negative. Uh, he doesn't like to publish that. But uh, if he's going to be uh, publish a an unbiased uh, estimate, it must it must sometimes be unphysical. So if nothing uh, goes wrong that I showed on the previous on one of the previous slides, Migrad will always find the best estimate of the three parameters and a good estimate of the error matrix. And this, the accuracy of the error matrix can be confirmed by the HESA command. HESA uh, is command just calculates the second derivatives, uh, including the off diagonal ones, and calculates the and calculates the second derivative matrix and inverts it to get the error mix and it gives you the full error matrix. Now, the uh, maximum likelihood works fine even for nonlinear problems, uh, but this uh, the error matrix from the second derivatives 
uh, doesn't always work quite so well. Now let's look at that. Now, if the problem is linear, then there are two ways to calculate the errors. One is by looking at the uh, second derivative here. I, I show this only in one dimension, but of course it's all uh, uh, can be extended to many dimensions. Uh, you can also, it also happens to be exactly equal to the error you would get by following the likelihood down to a point which, uh, for which the, the probability content of this, of this interval <clears throat> corresponds to the confidence level that you wanted to get when you, when you specified. So if, you, if you're doing log likelihood, not too log likelihood, but, too, but just log likelihood, then uh, when the likelihood uh, goes down by uh, one half, not a factor, just a sum, one half addition, then uh, then this is, is one standard deviation. Okay, so this is x plus sigma and x minus sigma. This is just a property of the parabola. So you could do it by calculating second derivatives here, or you can do it by following the likelihood down until it descends by one, one half for the, uh, in this case of log likelihood. And if you go to want the two standard deviations, you have to go down four times as far because it's a parabola, so it's squared. And, and those two are, give the same value. So you can do it by the second derivative or you can do it by uh, what we call the method of up. This distance is called up in, in, uh, in mean, mean real jargon. This is the, the error definition. You define the error as the amount that you go down from the minimum. This is a maximum because it's a likelihood, but for the price group. Now, supposing that uh, the likelihood or chi squared does not have a parabolic shape, but has a skew shape like this, then, uh, then the answer you get from the second derivative is not the same as the answer you get from the uh, method of up. And the question is, uh, is one of them right or both of them wrong? Or what, what, is the, what do you really want? And it's again, a question of geometry. Uh, it's, it's obvious, it was obvious to me that the right answer is the one which is invariant. If you just change from mass to mass squared, you don't want to change the, you don't want to change the errors. The errors on the mass squared should be the square of the errors on mass. And, and this is a question of, uh, of coordinate systems, if you, you can always change this coordinate system so that, uh, so that it, you get a, a real parabola. And when you get a real parabola, they're the same. But when you go to this method, the method of up gives you the same values, but the second derivative does not. So it's, it was obvious to me that the right way to do it is not to do the second derivative, but to follow the likelihood down to this point. Now, that was, uh, that's one way of calculating the, the confidence interval. And uh, that is what Minri does if you do it by so-called minus. So if you ask for the minus errors, it gives you these errors. If you ask, if you just ask for the so-called parabolic errors, it gives you the errors from the second group. Now, uh, to explain uh, the difference and what we want to do in this case, uh, let's look at the bias of the maximum likelihood. Now, maximum likelihood is the, is the consistent uh, minimum variance, everything wonderful, except that it's biased. It's well known that maximum likelihood estimates are biased, even though they're invariant under change of coordinate. And, for some reason, this doesn't seem to have bothered the, the statisticians. This, this would 
But it's bothered me as, as a physicist that this, how can it be that if maximum likelihood access estimates are invariant, how can they be biased? Because they're unbiased in one coordinate system. And if they're invariant, they should be the same in all coordinate systems. Well, the problem, of course, is not anything wrong with the maximum likelihood estimate, but the usual definition of bias is simply wrong. The definition of bias is not invariant. So uh, the difference between true value and the expectation of the estimate is itself not invariant. That is, the expectation of f of theta is not equal to f of the expectation of theta. So, and the bias is always, de is always defined in terms of the expectation, which is the integral of the, the, it's the mean value of the function. So if bias is in terms of, uh, defined in terms of median instead of the mean, so if, I, if bias was de defined such that the, it, an unbiased parameter would have half the time the estimate would be too big and half the time too small, if it was defined that way, then it would be invariant and the maximum likelihood estimate would also be unbiased. So uh, this uh, means, first of all, that it's pretty clear that in general, the problem is not that maximum likelihood estimates are biased. They're not biased, in fact. They're biased because only if you define bias incorrectly. If you define bias in, a, in an invariant way, then maximum likelihood estimates are unbiased. This removes the one problem that maximum likelihood estimates had, which it turns out is just a mistake on the property of, on, on the part of statisticians. They didn't see this. Now, a physicist immediately sees this, that, that it's uh, things, uh, things like confidence intervals have to be invariant. They cannot depend on, on how you, on whether you do mass or mass squared. It's, it's not possible, physically impossible. So if they, uh, you have to define them in a way that they're, that they're invariant. Now, coverage is, the, is a, a big problem, as I'll show in a minute. Coverage is uh, it, uh, an estimate that a confidence interval has a, a coverage if when you repeat the experiment many times, the probability that the intervals will contain the true value is alpha, then it has coverage at level alpha. So that, that's a, a well-defined thing with a, with a objective probability uh, that you can measure. And the way you do that, of course, is you, you choose different true values. And for every different true value uh, in your Monte Carlo, you repeat if, uh, if you know the value of the alpha then you can know what the data are going to look like so you generate random data and you do your maximum likelihood or whatever mean we and you find the confidence levels and then you ask whether the true value is inside the confidence level or not and then you that will give you the, the coverage of that of that method so it depends on the method but not on the true value and if you quote a 68% confidence interval, the common interpretation of that, which is correct, is that if you quote 68% and your actual coverage is less than 68%, you are cheating. You are telling, telling people that your errors are smaller than they really are. Okay, so. Coverage is important, and uh, I think everyone, at least the experts in statistics that I know, uh, agree that that's what physicists want coverage. They want, uh, if they don't want errors that are too small or too big. Okay. So a lot of people have gone, uh, tried to find out how to calculate confidence intervals so that they have exact coverage. And uh, Fisher tried. He was the, he's considered the founder of modern statistics, and and he was very much anti-Bayesian. He wanted he thought that that you 
the, the solution that the confidence intervals should cover not uh, using subjective probability, which was the case with the, with the Bayesian method, but that you could use it, you could calculate them using only objective probabilities and find uh, exact coverage. But he never managed to do that uh, for reasons which we now understand. But Yeji Neyman came a little bit later and found the, the construction, which is very beautiful and uh, I like it very much. And it, it allows you to construct uh, confidence intervals which necessarily cover exactly. But in order to calculate the Neyman construction, the likelihood function is not enough. You need also the full Monte Carlo because you need to know the distribution of data for every possible value of the parameter that you're, in, <clears throat> that you're estimating. So why does not mean we calculate the, kind of the confidence intervals with exact coverage? The first <laughs> answer is that it can't do that because it can only see the likelihood function. So you can't get the exact coverage if you can only see the likelihood function. However, there are other reasons for the fact. The naming construction, uh, which by the way, uh, becomes the Feldman Cousins algorithm if you introduce the famous uh, uh, criterion for uh, which removes the ambiguity to the name and construction. The name and construction only gives the right coverage, but it doesn't give you the best intervals of the right coverage. And the Feldman Cousins gives you the best intervals of the right coverage, but it really only works for one or two true parameters. And two is already difficult. And then there, if you want to use it, you must use their uh, their uh, publication in which they show the example for two free parameters. It's quite complicated. And it doesn't work well because it basically overcovers. And when you study it, when you look at it, you, whether it's Solomon Cousins or just the original Lehman construction, you can see immediately why it, uh, it cannot cover exactly in certain circumstances. In particular, for if you have more than one parameter, you will always overcover because you insist uh, on never undercovering. And if you insist on that you never undercover, then sometimes you have to overcover. In particular, if the data are discrete, if you have counting data, uh, Poisson, for example, or binomial, uh, exact intervals always overcover, even for one parameter. So that's a a, a reason, even though the main con naming construction is beautiful and Feldman Cousins is really very nice, it's uh, it has this this problem that it overcovers. So coverage is a fundamental problem. What do you do about it? Well, for one parameter, Minnow solves the problem by invoking invariance with respect to tra parameter transformations. So for, for a physicist, this is simply. Uh, uh, the right way to do it because it provides invariant confidence intervals. Now, if you have more than two parameters, three parameters, then Minos does well already for two parameters. It uh, uses a method which was at the time when I introduced that was, was new and uh, later was discovered by statisticians and then they call it profile likelihood. What, what you do in profile likelihood is you calculate the likelihood for as a function of one or two parameters, but minimizing or maximizing the likelihood with respect to all the other parameters. And that's called profile likelihood. And, uh, but when I introduce it into Minui, it was just called MINOS. That's what the physicists have been using it for now, I don't know, 50 years uh, without, uh, and, and, uh, and it was just re more recently, well, 20 years ago, this discovered by statisticians who found out, because you can now do Monte Carlo calculations, which were impossible uh, 50 years ago, 
the, the computer is a little slow. And now you can uh, you can calculate the actual coverage by Monte Carlo, and you find out that it's extremely good, and you avoid the problems of the, <coughs> of applying the name and construction. So when the likelihood is a function of more than two free parameters, you can look at the profile contours of two parameters, for a function of two parameters uh, for the, with the likelihood maximized with respect to all the other parameters. And that's called the profile likelihood. Minima, Minos has been using this uh, since it was first introduced. And, uh, and that turns out to have excellent coverage. So you, uh, for large numbers of parameters, the more if you try to get exact coverage, uh, and if you can get exact coverage, but then you have to get over coverage. And the more parameters you have, these are nuisance parameters, of course. They're not the ones you're interested in, but you have to estimate them in order to estimate the one you are interested in. So. It, it has excellent coverage, and they're much better than than, than exact coverage. <laughs> so, so this is a, a case where uh, uh, you know this is what the the minus errors look like, and they come uh, for, the, uh, for two parameters. If this uh, if this is a, a contour of the likelihood, and this is actually comes from a, a real experiment, uh, which I happen to be doing at the time when I wrote this. Uh, so this is a, you can see how this is a nonlinear function, because if it was a linear problem, the, uh, the contours would be ellipses. And as you get closer to the minimum, they look more elliptical. And when you get very close to the minimum, they're very elliptical, real ellipses. But as you get farther away, uh, you get areas where you see this is much farther away than you would expect from the ellipse here. This is much farther away. That's because simply uh, these are, these this region here is more probable uh, than the region which uh, than than you would expect if this was a, a exact ellipse. So you have to take account of that. You have to make your errors larger. And what Minri does is it finds the, it finds the, the, the limits, the uh, ex uh, exterior limits of this uh, this contour. This is for two two uh, standard deviations, so log likelihood log likelihood minus two, and this is log likelihood minus a half. If you use minus two log likelihood, it's one and four for the value of r. And so Minos does all this, and you don't have to. Uh, worry about it, things can happen. The, these contours can do all, cause, all sorts of strange things. There could, be, uh, there could be a region out here where it suddenly becomes, uh, the likelihood suddenly becomes bigger. It gets, it gets better, the fit gets better, and you get a second uh, minimum or maximum uh, or here. So now all this, uh, has been written up more or less in various places. The historical paper, uh, which uh, is uh, cited enormously, uh, uh, is the one that we wrote in 1975, uh, when the, and this was already included Minos, and uh, mo most of what is now in the, in the current version. So most, almost all of this is still relevant, even though it was written in 1975. Uh, there's a, a few things you may notice. There's a punch command here, uh, which will be uh, amusing to younger people because you may not even know that there were punch cards at one time, which we used, but which have, of course, uh, disappeared completely by now. Now, uh, the, 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 this, there's a book which, uh, the first edition of which I participated with four other uh, physicists and, and mathematicians to write, in, that was published in 1971. 
And uh, the second edition of this book was published by me alone in 2006. And that has all the stuff that I've shown today ex uh, explained correctly, I hope. And plus uh, a lot more, it's, it's a full book on statistics. What, what I would, uh, what I regret now is that I didn't, when I, when I wrote this, I knew about the problem of bias, that the, the bias is defined wrong. In, and, and I explain in the book what, 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 how it should be defined, but I haven't really, but I didn't really uh, say all the consequences that it has. If it's less defined differently, expectation has to be defined differently. And it turns out that the whole, point of, of maximum likelihood being the most efficient method becomes much easier to explain because then it's not biased anymore. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether one shouldn't write another book where you don't define in the classical way, but you define uh, bias and, and, uh, and variance in the new way. You have, it, it would be lots of changes and it wouldn't agree with any of other statistics books that exist. So <laughs> I, don't, I haven't decided what to do about that. And then uh, uh, this is an interesting paper, but it's written for statisticians. So physicists who <clears throat> have, a, have great trouble understanding this thing, but at least it shows that, that statisticians did discover this in 1990. Uh, and uh, Fraser, he often worked with uh, 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 well, two or three other people who, who, and references in this paper give them uh, to other papers on that topic where they go from likelihood to significance. This is, uh, this is the discovered in around 1990 by the statistical uh, uh, people who didn't know about what we were doing, but they just quite independently discovered that they, they had very good properties. So um, that's what I wanted to say, and I open it for a discussion, if there's time for discussion. Questions? Thank you. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can raise your hand. Um, so, okay, so uh, I actually have two questions. Um, so first of all, um, I know, um, mean not uh, the the way it calculates the error of parameters is it, it calculates how much the parameter has to change in order for FCN to change by up. Right. Uh, um, sometimes I saw people do some like um, so a nice fitting will give you a chi square over NDF that is less than one or about one. But sometimes I saw people do when chi square over NDF is larger than one. Uh, they they scale the uh, arrows of parameter by square root of chi square over NDF. <laughs> and in some and even I saw in some software not root but like GNU plot by default they scale it by chi square uh, square uh, square root of chi square over NDF. What do you think of this treatment? Well, that assumes that the reason uh, that your chi square is too too big. Uh, is because you have underestimated the errors in the, in your expression for chi squared, and so if you uh, now that may be true, but it may be may not be true. Normally, uh, at least in the experiments I've done, and, uh, uh, the errors in in the measurement and, and so forth are, are quite well known, and uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't get chi squares, which are much bigger than the number of degrees of freedom. Of course, it's not exactly chi squared in these degrees of freedom, which, which count. It's, it, there's a, the probability uh, the, the so-called p-value is, is an important uh, number, but that's, that's a detail. But uh, the, the point is, it, there's a, chi squared has a, not only a value for uh, estimates, but it can also do goodness of fit test. And if the chi squared is too big, that means it's not a good fit. And that's another, that's a different chapter in, in the statistics book. Uh, 
okay but it's it's uh, 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 so it, it's not the same kind of reasoning uh, you get for as a, for a confidence uh, limit but it's related okay so uh, so if you if you get a bad fit then uh, then you have to find out or decide what you think is wrong what, why it's a bad fit or if it's too good that's also a bad fit in my in my in my opinion if mm -hmm. it, if the chi squared is too small uh, that means you've got too good a fit and that is usually uh, due to something something wrong that you didn't, didn't notice but that's typical for example when you have a, a big accelerator uh, which has four different experiments doing the, doing the same thing and they get four different values for the W mass, for example, this happened with the W mass. And then they get, uh, uh, when you, if you do the chi squared for the four different uh, values of the W mass, you find it's much too small. They, they're too close together. And the reason is, of course, that when they were doing the error analysis, so the four experiments were talking to each other. And so they didn't, no, no one wanted to get an, uh, uh, an estimate which is very different from what the others were getting. And so they were actually too close. And uh, they, I don't think they even noticed that, but maybe somebody did notice it. But, uh, so sometimes chi-square can be too small, sometimes can be too big, sometimes you know why, uh, and sometimes you don't. But uh, to, so uh, in the data, in the analysis of, uh, for example, particle properties, that's what the particle properties group does, is it, uh, it if, if the chi-squared is too small, then it's all right, it leaves it small. But if the chi-squared is too big, then it increases the errors in all the, in all the uh, estimates. And that turns out to be probably not too bad. It's probably a sign that there's something wrong with some of the of the estimates and you don't know which ones they are and probably the best thing is just to increase the errors on the on the increase the error on the average the average is is, is has a bigger error than, than you expected because they don't agree with it so that's a that's a question of of finding out what's uh, what's wrong okay um and uh, another question that I have is, um, so my understanding from what you uh, talked about just now is, it's better like, uh, it's better not to set a limit for the parameter. Uh, so menu can perform better without the limit. Uh, or um, what if uh, for some parameter, we already know it, there is a, limit, like there is a range. Uh, do you think it's better to set a limit or not to set a limit? Uh, okay, that, uh, I, um, in general, I prefer not to set limits to see what happens when you, uh, and probably the best thing to do is to quote a result with limits and without limits, because people want to know, for example, a mass, you know a mass has to be positive, Okay, so uh, so it's better for the for somebody who wants to to decide uh, from your measurement whether the mass what what the mass is. You might want to include the information that it has to be positive, mm -hmm. but you might also want to leave it uh, free and see what it what it, what it turns out to be. And the reason you might want to leave it free is because you want to see whether, if you have imagined 10 different experiments measuring the same thing, you want to see whether actually all of them get uh, negative masses or all of them get positive masses and so forth. If, if the true value is very close to zero, then half of the experiments should get negative masses. And so it'd be nice to know, you know do half of them really get negative masses? That's what you would expect if, even if the mass was not negative. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, and I see Tong, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. So actually, um, there one of the questions is actually follow up your question, Xiaoyu. So I was wondering if, for example, we have uh, like the same data input and for one iteration, we just run the algorithm without a limit on certain uh, parameter. Uh, and for the other one, like we do set a parameter limit, uh, we give it a range. But we, if we do know that for the one without a limit, the final parameter is going to fall in that range anyways. Is it guaranteed that uh, whichever way we choose, we're going to end up with the same value? Or is it that if we like give it a prior range, it will somehow magically change the like end up point where we're like where where it finally lands on versus like when yeah. we don't give it a limit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's no yes, that's a good question. There, there's no guarantee. In fact, the the likelihood may not even be defined outside the physical region. The it depends on how it's being calculated. Uh, but if it is, uh, and if, if it goes outside the physical region during the fit, it, but the real minimum is inside the physical region, it should come back inside. That, but of course, there's no guarantee uh, because uh, what you see in one or two dimensions is much simpler than what actually occurs in, in 10 or more dimensions. Uh, you, it's very hard to see that well, there may be funny val uh, valleys in the chi squared or in mountains in the likelihood which are, are curved and which which uh, go around the, the point you're interested in or and it, it's very hard to uh, just to, to, to guess what it's what's going to happen to it but that's uh, uh, one reason why we put into minri the fix and restore command so that you can sort of guide it to the place where you want it to be, but in, in the in the last stage, it's best to, in my opinion, to leave it free, uh, so to find out where where it's going to go if it if it doesn't have constraints. Uh, but the, in the end, the uh, it is probably best to, to give a value with constraints and a value without constraints. Then the the person who reads the paper can um, can decide for himself whether uh, what what he wants to learn about the parameter from the, from those two things. He, that's all you that's all you need to know to decide what uh, what you believe about the parameter. Okay, thank you. So the next question I'm having is on the estimated. Uh, distance to minimum, like the EDM yes. uh, function that you were talking about. Like, could you please yes. elaborate a little bit more on this? Because like, I, I find it a little bit hard to just like, just to, to visualize how you do this, given that you don't even know like where the minimum is, like mm -hmm. how do you actually do the estimation okay. on yeah, the that's distance? Not, uh, yeah, that's not the, uh, but you have to believe that invariants are really invariant. And uh, uh, and I, I must admit I have sometimes trouble with that, but I <laughs> I was convinced when I when I did this uh, uh, exercise with the track fitting that uh, amazingly I mean you get you got that enormous guy squared way way outside because it was a very bad fit, but it it tell it gave you the dist EDM which was was correct to to two two or three decimal places it was amazing. Uh, the reason is that the the function value. Uh, how can I explain this? The 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 the, the, the function value. Uh, it knows where the function value is going to be, but it doesn't know how to get to the point in the parameter space. That's the problem. The minimization is a is is a is a minimization in the parameter space, which tries to find out where in the parameter space the function takes on its minimum. And when it does that, then it knows uh, everything about the minimum. But while, while it's farther away, uh, it, it learns where the minimum is going to be in function value before it learns where, how to find the, the place where it has that value. That's all I could say. Then that, that, 
And that's what you would expect from uh, the geometry of space, essentially, uh, from uh, that the invariants are invariant. And, uh, and the function value uh, has that. So, so that if you, if you think in, in this sort of general relativity way that, that the, the properties of, of matter are not really properties of matter, but they're just functions of, of, of geometry, they're just properties of the geometry of the space. If you, you could modify, you can transform the, the geometry of the space, but certain things remain invariant when you do that. And, and one of them is the EDM. Okay, fact, thank you. <laughs> it's the only, only one. <laughs> the, the, other, the other one that I found is that if you, if you use the, uh, the inverse of the error matrix, so that would be the, uh, I guess the covariant uh, metric tensor, you can find the distance between where you are and where you want to be in parameter space in, in uh, units of standard deviations. That's also an invariant. But that's exactly the same thing as, as the method of up, okay? <laughs> as you're looking at. Uh, and so, so th that's the other, that's the other invariant that I found. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>